Okay, everybody, if I could ask that uh, everybody start taking their seats, um, getting comfortable. I'd like to read uh, our next speaker is going to be the topic is going to be transition to an integrated solar health system. None other than Mr. Daniel Mays. Daniel Mays runs Fritz Farm in Southern Maine, where he's been growing vegetables commercially using no-till methods since 2011. He holds a master's degree in environmental engineering and shares his holistic, correct, holistic approach to agriculture and a unique set of progenitive growing strategies at workshops and events across the United States. Without further ado. Thank you. Nice to be with you all virtually. Um, can, can you hear me okay? All right. So um, yeah, I'm Daniel Mays. Um, lovely to yeah present across the such distances uh, to you. Just taking a break from our rainy day here on the farm. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, an integrated soil health system. So basically, I'm just going to give a, a rundown of how how we farm here at Frith Farm in in Scarborough, Maine, just south of Portland. Um, and I'm I got a lot of pictures, so because they're worth a thousand words. So we're gonna I'm gonna kind of go pretty quickly through all this, and please kind of take note of any questions you have, and then we'll have the Q and A at the end. Um, but it'll be a bit of a whirlwind of just dumping uh, images and information on you uh, to begin with. Um, so we'll get right into it. Uh, this is uh, for some context. This is the farm um, that I purchased, the land that I purchased 13 years ago. It was an open hay field, uh, hadn't been used in agriculture for some time aside from being mowed once a year. So it was open. Um, and then it had a falling down old farmhouse on it, which uh, I joke brought the value of the land down a little bit so I could afford it better. Um, so uh, yeah, we've come a long way since then. Um, this is the farm, uh, I guess a few years ago, uh, thanks to a drone image. Um, but we are, uh, yeah, three and a half acres of, of pretty intensive vegetable production. Uh, we have nine full-time seasonal employees. And we sell through CSA. About 60% of our sales are to CSA. That's all on-farm pickup. And then we do another 30% or so to natural food stores and a little bit through an on-farm store. Um, so we're very intensive production. Um, we gross about $100,000 per acre. Um, and we're able to do that through our sort of somewhat unique, although less unique these days, um, uh, growing methods. So I'll get into those. So I like to, I like to look to nature as, as the model of soil health because um, nature is constantly repairing and regrowing and building soil um, if we can sort of get out of the way. Uh, or follow that model. Um, to some extent, agriculture is in contradiction with that. You know, we're trying to choose which crops we grow, um, but to the extent we can follow this model, even with imposing some control on the land, um, the soil will really benefit. So, yeah, what do we have here in this picture? It looks like a you know an overgrown field that needs to be mowed and tidied up, right? Some trees encroaching, but actually that is the like. The diversity and the and the biomass and the photosynthesis that's you know that's what generates healthy soil so that's really the model we're trying to emulate which is no small task growing uh annual vegetables which are sort of dumbed down you know annual plants um genetically uh to to you know meet the market that we have so <clears throat> if i had to boil it all down to a nutshell um, the, here's the one step guide to soil health. Step one, keep the soil undisturbed and covered, ideally in a diverse abundance of living plants. Uh, it's kind of that simple or like, it's easy to write that, right? But how do you, how do we do it? Um, but really, yeah, that, that undisturbed and covered. So we're not damaging the soil life that's already there. And then in a diverse abundance of living plants is generating more soil, generating more life. Uh, in the soil. And here's a few little preview photos. You know, this is tomatoes and basil. So, you know, you see just 
yeah, there's a lot of photosynthesis happening there, a lot of production, um, which also translates to, you know, economic value, but it's, it's soil health at the same time. Here is a cover crop. Yeah, this is, this is a vegetable. These are our permanent, you know, no-till vegetable beds. Doesn't really look like it, but uh, so it's a sorghum Sudan cover crop with, uh, you know, goldenrod and um, bee balm in our, one of our perennial strips right next to it. And here's uh, some rye cover cropping that we do each year uh, over the winter and then terminate it. Um, so these are just little previews. I'll, I'll get into all of it um, in the slides. But first, um, I really want to start with the basics um, because, you know, as I've shared these methods with other growers over the years, it's become really clear you got to start right. Um, you got to get the foundational building blocks right, or else all these other sort of higher order practices uh, tend to fail. Um, so establishing the beds and getting them weed free um, and in a productive state is sort of the first building block. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about how we do that, establishing beds from sod. First step is to do a soil test. Um, you know, it can be any soil test, even just the basic one, you know, through the university extension service, it's 18 bucks for soil test. Um, Cause really I'm with this, I'm not looking at fine tuning, you know, really anything. I'm looking at the, the, the big picture of what is the pH, uh, what is the organic matter, it's nice to see. And then what are the major sort of, you know, deficiencies or excesses and balances in the soil chemistry. Um, because since we're, you know, forming these beds with tillage, you know, you'll see that no till, production, but we do form the beds with tillage, uh, it's sort of our last chance to mechanically mix in amendments, um, which, you know, if we're trying to adjust the pH or uh, improve uh, sort of minerals in the soil, then this is an opportunity to do so. So first step is the soil test. Second step uh, is to mark out the plots. So that's, you know, that's no small step because these are, um, we practice, you know, what we call permanent no-till, permanent raised beds. So these beds don't move around. Um, this is unlike sort of, you know, traditional larger scale tractor farming where the beds are just remade every year and it doesn't really matter, you know, maybe they move a few feet over or uh, a few feet shorter one year or the next, but these beds are permanent. They don't get reformed, um, remade each year. So marking out the plots is worth thinking through because we want to make sure we have vehicle access to the head of each plot. Uh, we want to think about drainage, you know, where are the slopes, where are the wet spots, we want to avoid those or fill those in. Um, I'm going to think about shading of any trees nearby um, and just the overall flow of the farm. Uh, you know, how how is harvest going to look where what is that flow diagram going to look like of, of getting seeds in the ground and you know, harvests to the wash station? So yeah, it's worth some real thought. Also recognizing can't predict the future. So do the best, but just get those plots marked out. Um, and then I'm really a firm believer in this sort of uh, standardized um, layout. So every bed is the same length, same width, um, every plot has the same number of beds. So it's sort of this modular system that makes things so much easier when it comes to crop planning, crop rotation, uh, you, you know, seed calculations, uh, yield records, um, irrigation setup, tarp sizes, row cover length, like all these all these things that can be such a headache on on farms are immediately made really simple just with that one simple choice of making all your beds the same dimensions. Um, so we've tried to do that as best we can. Um, and yeah, we have 16 plots. Each plot has 12 beds. Each bed is five feet uh, from the center of, path, of one path to the center of the next path. And then we do perennial hedgerows between each plot to help separate them visually and also to inject some uh, diversity into the farm. Um, and then we have vehicle access at the at each end of every plot uh, for ease of harvesting or or you know whatever needs to be brought there to the plot. 
And you can say, what does this have to do with soil health, you know, an integrated soil health system? But this, you know, this is the setup that enables so much, so many other practices. If we keep all this really simple and efficient and organized, streamlined, then that frees up time and energy to, you know, focus on cover cropping and other, other practices that get really complicated really fast if you have a, a hodgepodge of bed sizes. So step three, uh, spread compost and amendments. Um, you know, we do this with a five gallon bucket, just shaking it out because we're so small scale, but you could, you know, have a spreader or something. Um, but yeah, trying to get those amendments according to that soil test. Um, so lime to raise the pH, um, you know, whatever mineral deficiencies there might be, maybe it looks like here we're spreading green sand. Um, so to spread those out evenly on the plot. And notice we have the whole plot staked out so that it's you know very accurate sort of precision applying these uh not just sort of all over the whole field yeah and then here's uh yeah in the presentation on no till is is the tillage image of you know this is definitely tillage this is a rotary plow on the bcs walking tractor and uh it's definitely primary tillage you know it's really chopping up that sod it kind of is like a bladed corkscrew so it kind of chops it up and flips it over all all at the same time so you can see you get pretty good um you know transformation from the sod to to you know workable soil and then once it's all tilled up you go back through and make a pass up and down each path with that rotary plow and you can see the implement kind of spits out the soil to the side a little bit. So by making a pass up and down each path, you've actually formed uh, your raised beds. They require a little touch up with a rake, especially with the sort of sod chunks and stuff in there. But it's, uh, it yeah, it makes light work of what would be a lot of work to do by hand. Uh, there are other ways to form beds, you know, if, especially for farms that already have, you know, tractor implements. Um, I will say there's a level of care and detail that is important here since these are permanent beds. You really want to get those dimensions right so that they're uniform bed to bed. Um, otherwise, you know, tarps or irrigation or things start to not quite cover, and then you'll have issues down the line. So really taking the time to measure and do this precisely is, is worthwhile. And then, you know, you can look at this picture of, you know, freshly tilled soil and be like, well, that's plantable, right? And, but the answer is no, because all of that sod will regrow quite happily. Um, and there'll be a whole influx of uh, weed seed germination from that soil disturbance. So the first, you know, the next step, step six is to, to uh, tarp. Um, and we tarp, uh, this is mainly to kill those perennial uh, roots. Uh, whatever grasses or um, weeds you might have that that the roots are still very much alive even though they've been tilled. Uh, so this we typically leave this tarp on um, probably six to eight weeks during the sort of heat of the season and that gives a pretty you know for the for the quack grass and dandelions and the kinds of um, perennial roots we have that's pretty reliable kill um, given the heat of the summer. And this is what it looks like when the tarps come off. Um, you notice our little tarp kits there with the concrete blocks on a pallet, 30 blocks put on a pallet and then the tarp goes on top and that way the tractor can move those around easily from plot to plot. Um, but yeah, this soil, you know, pulling those tarps off, this, this soil has been, uh, you know, it's been tilled and then tarped. So it's just kind of like really killed all plant life in it. So this is very vulnerable exposed soil um we want to get it covered right away that's really one of our mantras is to never see the soil so when we do see the soil we want to get it covered as soon as possible so as soon as that tarp comes off we spread uh mulch on top and um i say mulch but this is compost and we use compost as a mulch uh that's sort of a key uh maybe switch in the mind for some people. They think of compost as a soil amendment that you like till in, but we use compost as a mulch and that really enables, that's at the heart of what, of our success um, because it not only 
covers the soil and prevents you know prevents weed germination has all the soil benefits of holding in moisture slow release uh fertilizer um but it yeah it's that it's that weed barrier that prevents the weed growth if you apply it thick enough which is about you know at least two inches two to three inches thick that really acts as a weed barrier um to give you a weed free weed free growing area um weed free but it's also plantable uh with a cedar you can direct seed right into the compost and get you know crop coming up with no weeds so that's that's really the magic of this um system uh is is that ability to yeah direct seed and have weed free crop coming up no matter how many weed seeds you might have had down below in the soil because it's all covered um so notice also the wood chips in the path like the paths also need to be covered we got to see no soil anywhere because wherever we see soil we're going to get weeds you know weeds are nature's way of healing bare soil so anytime there's bare soil you will get weeds and and that's nature trying to heal herself and what do we do we, we kill the weeds we keep really sort of sustaining that injury um uh yeah i see weeds as a messenger relaying that we need to get that soil covered so we just continually kill the messenger as as farmers often and then don't really ever get the message through to to get that soil covered so so yeah this is trying to start with the soil covered uh, before we even plant anything the soil already has a layer of of cover it's think of it as a sort of o horizon on steroids you know it's that three inches of of organic matter that we can then plant into and this is the the planted beds you know after we've raked out that compost very carefully so that we're not stirring up soil into it since the soil is full of weed seed we're trying to really entomb that soil just lay the blanket of compost out over top overlap slightly with the wood chips in the past so there's completely seamless um you know never seeing the soil and then you can direct seed right into that this is um a winter kill mix of cover crops <clears throat> uh probably oats barley uh some clover some peas um I think there's some daikon in there so this is uh you know without any weeding we have this cover crop coming up and there's you know completely weed free this is it later and you can see our uh, perennial strip on the side there to help you know mark where the plot begins and this is it later in the fall you know it's about waste waist high uh this is where if you have livestock it's a great time to run your livestock through in the fall and add their biology to the mix get some fodder out of it um and uh yeah sort of stimulate this this biology further and then it's remember these species these cover crop species were selected to die in the cold of winter so uh that's what happens they winter kill the snow falls and knocks them down and this is what the plot you know looks like the following spring um this sort of nice grown in place straw that's that's all dead and and you know the roots have died too so it's ready for early planting as early as you want in the spring if we uh yeah this we can just rake off the debris you know it's it's already sort of breaking down at the roots so you can it can just be raked right into the path if you want a direct seed or you can transplant right through it so that's the the gist of starting the beds um you know i've tried various different ways to establish beds and that's sort of my favorite that really works well and really jump starts the the soil life you know back up right back after you've uh you know tilled and tarped which is a pretty severe disturbance to it so once we have these beds uh to maintain them is can be as simple as just you know one crop comes out you plant the next crop so this is these two beds on the right are um carrots seeded right after a lettuce crop was harvested so we just kind of lightly raked out you know any any undulations in the bed um to get a smooth bed for the carrots um it can be that simple 
or if there's crops that leave a lot of residues, you know, like a kale crop, we want to flip the bed, then we'll come and flail mow. So there's a flail mower attachment for the BCS walking tractor. Um, you can also use, you know, a tractor flail mower. I, I will say, I know of, of farmers doing these methods with tractors. Um, I think that's possible, but it's tricky because the, tr the extra weight and that you're a little farther from the crop. So it's harder to be as precise. And as soon as that tractor wheel starts churning up soil, uh, instead of just riding over the mulch, like then you're getting weeds again. So, so yeah, just to, you know, this scale and this intensity, I think really lends itself well to um, not needing a tractor in the fields besides this walk behind PCS. So here's, here we are flail mowing it. A flail mower just chops everything up, leaves it right on the surface. Uh, it does not kill the roots, however, and brassicas will regrow from the roots. So we do tarp again briefly to, uh, to terminate those roots. Um, and the tarping, this could be as little as, um, you know, a couple days or even a day if it's really hot and sunny, that tarp can really cook, cook things. But if it's, co if it's cooler and cloudy, it might be a couple weeks. So, so the tarping is very weather dependent at its effectiveness. But then the tarp comes off and we can plant right through um, those residues. So this, you know, here we see some spinach we've direct seeded and you can see the old stubble that was arugula. And we've just kind of offset the cedar to go right between those arugula rows. Um, so there's really, you know, often we, we view tillage as a way to sort of uh, wipe the slate clean and like prep the bed for the next crop. But really we've, we're kind of, redefining plantable, I guess, um, with a lot of these crops, because they just don't need this sort of perfectly fluffed up, um, you know, debris free bed to plant into. And then as soon as we start seeing weeds, remember, we know that that means we need more soil coverage. So that's when we'll come and apply more compost, typically once a season. Uh, we will uh, compost the beds. Um, I will say after you apply compost for a few years like this, you got to watch your nutrient levels because if it's a manure based compost, phosphorus levels will go up. Um, so to keep an eye on that with hopefully an annual soil test. Um, and then when those phosphorus levels get high or as high as you want them, maybe switching to a uh, not manure based compost. So we now use composted leaves. It's nothing but tree leaves that have been composted. So they have very low NPK, basically zero, 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 um, but with trace minerals and the same function of weed barrier that we, that we sort of rely on with the, um, with the mulch application. And for spreading this, you know, this is a lot of compost. Uh, each bed maybe gets eight wheelbarrows, you know, to get to two, three inches. So um, that would be a lot of work to sort of shovel by hand. So we do have a little tractor that does the heavy lifting and the transportation of the material to the heads of the bed. And there we line up three wheelbarrows and dump into that so that then we can be really precise and careful with application onto the bed just as needed. So the tractor never drives in the plots but the humans never have to like lift the compost. They're just working with gravity to dump it. And then, uh, yeah, same thing with the pads. Um, I see a lot of farmers, you know, sort of implement these things partway. Um, maybe they'll apply compost, but keep it really thin or they'll, or they'll go thick with the compost, but they won't do anything in the pads. And, and really this, you know, the benefits of this method are in that complete soil coverage, so you just don't get weeds. Um, so yeah, mulching the pads at the same time. Here we're using wood chips. We've used leaves before. We've used straw. Um, I've heard of people using rice hulls or pecan shells, you know, whatever you have locally that uh, came from the earth is a good material. There's really, um, I haven't seen any sign of nitrogen tie up from using wood chips or a really carbon rich uh, material in the paths, uh, because we're, remember we're not tilling it in. It's really when you till in that, that carbon that it really starts to tie up nitrogen. 
So this is a freshly sort of rejuvenated plot, you know, fresh, a fresh coat of paint, I like to say, with, with the mulch on top and the wood chips in the path. And, you know, I, I look at this plot and it just gives me a sigh of relief because I know there's going to be no weeds on this plot for, for, you know, weeks or months for the rest of the season, really. And when I say no weeds, I mean very, very few weeds. There are always a few that blow in or like somebody's foot had some dirt on it and like scuffed in. So we always go through and pull, but it's, it's kind of like an Easter egg hunt. We're looking for the, you know, two or three weeds on each bed and we're getting those before they set seed. So yeah, this complete soil coverage at all times. This is, you know, you can see back when we used leaves in the pathway. Um, it just, it's a joy to work with. It's kind of like, like pushing transplants in the brownie batter. It's just, uh, it's very satisfying too, to sort of know that we're not gonna have to come in here with a cultivator in like seven days to like start weeding. It's one, you know, kind of set it and forget it come back we we weed onions maybe two or three times the whole season um and have a, a pretty weed free crop by the end so that's you know pretty rare for organic vegetable production so that's how we form and maintain beds so that's sort of like the the 101 the basic you know building block that now we can uh the, the foundation we can build on now with these sort of next level strategies for soil health um because really you know keeping the soil undisturbed and covered in mulch is wonderful but it's not feeding the life of the soil it is not building more soil it is protecting what life is already there so if we really want to be working you know in the regenerative uh, method. If, if we think about what that word actually means, we're we're building life. We want to be building life, and that's what these strategies allow. And these strategies are made possible because we have that sort of streamlined foundation of, um, you know, never seeing the soil permanent standardized beds um, to to work from. So cover cropping, you know, this is. This is uh, no surprise. The cover cropping has been known to be sort of the organic way of, of building soil. Um, it's how nature builds soil everywhere. Um, so that's really, yeah, something we want to do. Uh, and then integrating animals, anything that gets more life into the onto the land, to me, is it moving in the right direction? Um, and then under sowing and interplanting, a way to get yeah, more photosynthesis and more diversity happening on the soil. And then perennial plantings, again, more diversity, more uh, more winged diversity, especially like perennial plants can really bring in a lot of uh, pollinators and, and beneficial insects uh, to the farm. And they act as sort of like this, yeah, there's sort of a perennial reservoir of, of biology in the soil that kind of can spread out onto the farm. So we're gonna go through those, those strategies. So no-till cover cropping. Uh, I think this says three scenarios. I think I'm just doing two scenarios. So there's, there's peas and oats in the fall. Uh, this is kind of like the, the, the gateway drug of, of cover crops. The peas and oats are very, uh, you know, simple, easy to, easy to germinate, easy to terminate. Uh, they typically winter kill, at least in our climate. Um, so yeah, often they'll go in the fall before the next year's early spring crops. They can go in the spring as well um, before, you know, summer crops. And then, yeah, I think I took out the middle scenario, but we're just going to talk about peas and oats and then uh, rye and some kind of legume, whether it's crimson clover or vetch. Um, this is a overwintered Crop, crop. It's a winter annual that uh, goes on beds that will be planted the following summer because it gets most of its growth in the um, spring. It, you know, it establishes in the fall, but really explodes with growth in the spring. So let's look at those examples. Uh, here's a crop of peas and oats. This was spring seeded. So this is, uh, you know, early June. They're in flower. Uh, this is kind of the time to, to terminate them. And we used to flail mow them because that was easy and we had the flail mower. 
and you can see that first bed, it, the flail mower just chops everything up and leaves it right on the surface, which is very effective, um, but it also chops it up so much that it doesn't stick around very long. It just sort of gets digested very quickly. Um, so then we uh, experimented with more human scale methods of, of knocking down the peas and oats. Let me see if I can get this to play, see if this will play through our uh, internet connection here. This is, uh, yeah, human, human scale uh, cover crop rolling. Uh, we, we don't actually do that for anything but fun, but that, that was, uh, yeah, two, two of the crew just rolling down the bed on top of the peas and oats to knock them down. Now we use um, a, uh, we sort of have a homemade crimper that we stomp on, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, but however you do it, you got to get the peas and oats just to fall down rather than get mowed and chopped up, and then we can pull a tarp on over them, and that will ensure that they terminate. Yeah, usually a week or so, depending on the weather. And then we pull that off, and this is those same peas and oats now that have been killed and sort of turned into a, a straw mulch that's just resting on the soil. And they rake off very easily. Um, into We just rake them into the paths so that then we can direct seed. And these are those same beds direct seeded. And here they are seeded to a uh, storage, turnips and radishes, which then, you know, produced very well and had very, very little weed pressure. So that's peas and oats. So winter rye is uh, much more of a sort of workhorse of a cover crop, much more biomass production and the added benefit that it grows right through the winter. So it's great sort of soil conservation for the winter. Crimson clover, I, I like that combination because uh, they flower around the same time the following spring. Um, although for us, crimson clover is sometimes winter kills, depending on the winter. So this is uh, after an onion crop uh, came out, we're seeding the beds to rye and clover. And we try to do this by the end of September. For us, it's kind of early October is the cutoff to get, you know, overwintered cover crop in. Uh, for winter kill cover crop, it's a month earlier. Try to ideally by the first week of September. But we are in zone 4B, so that's going to change depending on where you are. This is the, the Ryan Clover getting, you know, established. Nice and thick, good germination. We treat it just like a cash crop in terms of direct seeding it with the earthway, irrigating it with the overhead sprinklers. And we'll even come through and weed it if we notice any weeds in there, because um, we don't want those seeds dropping for the next crop. And then this is the following spring, uh, late May, early June. You know, the rye is six feet tall, uh, ready to be knocked down. This is our high tech uh, crimper. It's a two by four with some. Uh, some rope, you know, tied to the ends and some bicycle straps uh, screwed on there for your foot. Here's the underside of it. You can see uh, we've screwed a T-post to it to give it that sort of crimping blade. This is a lot of R&D went into this, by the way. This is um, patent pending. There's a bike strap. There's, uh, I think it's a piece of uh, PEX tubing there is the handle. And then here's a video of us in action. This is great team building uh, experience. Crimping that rye. So that is a workout, I will say. So it helps have a big crew or there are, you know, mechanical ways to do this. There are roller crimpers on tractors, obviously. Um, BCS, I think there's actually one for the BCS as well, um, or there are any number of like homemade ways to, 
you know, fill a barrel with water and roll it over um, just to get that ride and knock down. But I do kind of like this uh, two person team building exercise. And then it's important to knock it all down in the same direction. So you kind of work like a typewriter, um, come back to the start so that when we pull a tarp on, it doesn't snag every other bed. Uh, and then, yeah, we put that tarp on as usual, get it well sealed with all, you know, weighed down for windy days. And uh, I, this takes a little longer to kill than, than peas and oats or anything else because that rye is pretty established. Although I will say we wait until the rye is in its flowering stage. So it's near the end of its life cycle anyway. So it's ready, it's more ready to die. If you tried to do this early in the spring when it's just full of life force, you know, knee high, you'd have to tarp it for a long, long time to get it to die. Um, but yeah, I wanted to point out here too, this was those spring seeded peas and oats. And look how they're like calf high, they're just a foot high compared to this rye that was, you know, six feet tall, huge amount of biomass. So I, I like to point that out because often farmers will just stick with peas and oats because they're kind of safe and easy uh, to terminate. They don't get out of control. You can seed into them right afterwards. Um, but there's just a real difference in biomass production and therefore in soil regeneration um, between peas and oats and something like rye that is such a workhorse and can grow through the winter. So here's the tarp coming off the rye. You can see that it's a sort of beautiful golden oriented straw all in a line there that then we can plant right through. Um, it takes a little longer to plant through, maybe twice as long as you would if you're just going into compost or, or bare soil, but because uh, you can't use a dibble, you have to sort of use a trowel to get in through the roots of the rye. So that does slow things down, but I do believe it's worth it. Um, because you end up with such a, you know, soil health and also the, the weed protection of the rye. Um, you can use a broad fork turned parallel to the bed, almost as a dibble. So the tines are every four inches apart. So depending on your spacing, you can do every, you know, second, third hole um, for transplants that way. And that can help break through the root mass of the rye. Cause you know, the, this rye was intense. It's very vigorous cover crop. And although it's dead, it's still like, you know, very much there and in the way of, of just popping your plant into the ground. Here's another uh, method. This is us planting potatoes in the rye with a potaputki, which is a Scandinavian forestry tool for planting tree saplings. But this is a way to sort of not have to bend over you plunge that thing in, drop your potato in there if it's the right size. And then the foot opens up the hatch at the bottom so it drops thin, drops it into the hole. So that's sort of a nifty, uh, nifty ergonomic tool, but uh, not really necessary. It just saves you having to bend over to, you know, put a trowel in the ground and and plant that way. Uh, so anyway, this I we haven't used it with seedlings, but it is designed for tree saplings. So I imagine you could just pop a transplant in there as well. Um, you might want to tuck it in a little bit more though at the end than it would be left. So these are these are hand transplanted cabbages into that rye. And these are those cabbages later in the fall. I think we weeded this plot once and got maybe a dozen weeds out of it. So it's just, yeah, very low weed pressure. Um, I can't remember, we might've put a little bit of fertilizer in the hole as we transplanted these, um, but, but pretty minimal uh, inputs. So I really like this method um, because it's, you know, there's, uh, there's very few inputs, right? The only inputs are seed, pretty much. Seed and human time. Uh, we never fired up an engine for any of this succession, you know, from the rye to knocking it down, to planting the next crop. 
um, and maybe we put a little fertilizer in the hole, but it's very little. And so, yeah, the inputs are really sort of seed, um, seed and a little fertilizer. So here's some more riffs on, on cover crops. Make sure I'm doing all right on time. Yeah. Here's, uh, you know, this was an especially good stand of rye with vetch in it. I, I, I really like vetch. It, I took years to come around to planting it because I was afraid of terminating it. But as long as you get the kind of vetch that's grown as a cover crop, as opposed to sort of the wild vetch that is more of a weed, um, then this is, you know, it's a great combination. It's one of the few things that can actually stand its own with rye. It doesn't just get outcompeted and it produces, you know, fixes a, a lot of nitrogen and the rye gets a lot taller with it. Uh, here's, uh, you know, winter kill mix with fava beans and clover and peas and oats and barley. Um, yeah, I just look at that and, and, you know, I can envision the health of the next year's crop. You know, this is this is its health growing right here, especially with the sort of the wood chip mulched soil at, at the base. It's there's sort of layers of of health. There's layers of all all different diversity of life, but all diversity of decomposition at the same time. Here's a sorghum Sudan crop. You know, this is uh, eight to ten feet tall. It's hard to tell in the photo, but everyone thinks it's corn, but this is a cover crop, sorghum Sudan. Uh, with clover and and cow peas um, in the understory. Uh, again, just a huge amount of biomass uh, getting injected into this soil, which in combination with not tilling it is just an amazing uh, results for the next crop. Um, you know, often when farmers grow this kind of cover crop, they have to till it two, three, four times afterwards to get it back to that sort of plantable state that they're used to, but with no till in combination with cover crops, you know, this we just let winter kill, the snow knocks it down. We might flail mow it just to be, get it to knock down further, but sometimes we just plant right into it the next season. So there's, yeah, without that soil disturbance that the benefits of this cover crop aren't sort of negated. Here's another uh, summer cover crop mix with buckwheat in there. Um, this was a full season summer mix, so buckwheat was not a great choice to include because it just goes to flower so quickly. So then I'm in there siding it all the time to prevent those seeds from dropping. Um, but yeah, a lot of yeah, a lot of diversity there, and certainly the insects love the buckwheat flowers. This is yellow sweet clover in the fall. So it, it's, uh, it's a biennial, so it establishes in the in sort of late summer, fall, the year before. Um, we, we sowed some oats in there with it as a nurse crop. The oats have winter killed and the clover is sort of, you know, maybe a foot high um, established, but it like the rye, it does most of its growth the following spring. Um, we just broadcast this with a broadcast spreader straight into terminated rye. So this was back-to-back -back cover crops um, without any bed prep in between them. And this is that, that sweet clover the following spring next to our pepper crop. And this is that sweet clover a few weeks later, you know, six feet tall and just covered with these flowers that the the pollinators just go wild for it. It was like a, a humming, vibrating forest of just uh, bees and, and other insects. Tried to take a picture of the bees, but you know, it's hard to do. But yeah, you know, I'm I'm six foot four and this is me taking it at, at head height. So, you know, it's a that's a really a huge amount of biomass there and a huge amount of nitrogen fixation. Honestly, this requires a heavy feeder to go after it to not leach nitrogen uh, once it's terminated because it's producing so much. So yeah, some other you know ideas of cover crops, uh, all different clovers and legumes. Um, I really look at look at their life cycle and think about how they're going to be terminated because that's yeah always thinking ahead with these cover crops. 
Um, so the easiest way to terminate them is to let winter do it for us. Uh, so looking at the winter kill temperature, anything down to zero is pretty reliable. Will winter kill in our zone? We usually hit minus 20 at some point in the winter, although that's changing. We've had a couple winters where it didn't get below zero. So, so yeah, the, the winter peas and the crimson clover survived. Um, so yeah, but think choosing those crops wisely so that the winter can kill them or um, have a plan for, for knocking them down and tarping them. Build that into the, the crop plan. Um, and then also looking at their height and what they're pairing with um, so that they're not just getting shaded out or um, out competing something else. Then you have your grasses. <clears throat> Again, looking at their height and their winter kill temperature. Um, We've only done annual grasses, whether summer annuals or winter annuals. Um, there's certainly room to have perennial cover crops, um, especially if you have livestock. That could be a nice rotation, um, especially if you have more land. We're pretty land limited, so we do sort of quicker rotations. Uh, and then forbs, the broadleaf uh, plants. Um, and then thinking about combining these, uh, you know, three is a party, really. Uh, a grass plus a legume plus a forb, and you have diversity. You know, if, if there's a formula for cover crop diversity, that, that might be it. Um, certainly, you can get even more diversity. You have multiple grasses, multiple legumes. But to me, if you have at least one of each, then you have a pretty good, um, yeah, diversity. Certainly, a grass plus a legume um, is a nice mix. I would I would probably never do just one or the other because they both, it's a symbiotic relationship. They benefit from each other. So then, yeah, how to get even more life in there um, is with animals. Um, and, you know, this is, integrating animals can be any kind of animal. Um, livestock is certainly one way. Um, we've had sheep in the past and grazed the cover crops. They love these notes. Uh, we've had laying hens that circle the perimeter of the farm um, and can dip in to plots briefly with cover crops. You don't wanna leave laying hens very long on your permanent, nicely prepared <laughs> raised beds because they will till it for you. Uh, they love scratching and making dust baths and stuff. So if you do use laying hens, you know, move them real quick in and out um, with an established cover crop already in place. Turkeys, on the other hand, scratch much less, uh, at least the sort of broad-breasted kind that we tend to grow for Thanksgiving. So we used turkeys extensively to run over fall cover crops, and they add a huge amount of fertility and stimulate the, the, diverse, the biodiversity of the, the crop. So this is, uh, I like to call this one turkey on rye. This is <laughs> turkeys grazing rye cover crop. There's also a lot of uh, crimson clover in there. And the key here is to not overgraze. You know, we're, we're trying to maybe start with a, a foot or two of height and bring it down to no less than, you know, six inches, four to six inches, so that we're not killing the cover crop. We're actually stimulating it to, to grow more. So here's another version. Uh, this is on a, it looks like a peas, maybe oats and barley and peas. This is once they've moved on off of that uh, rye cover crop, notice how much green we've left. We've not let them like denude the, the plot or stir it up so much that we're seeing soil. And this cover crop will just bounce right back, especially with their manure um, and their grazing, the stimulation of them grazing. It's another one, it's like some daikon and oats and whatever else is in there winter kill cover crop. So yeah, this is next year's fertility. You know, this is a huge amount of life being harnessed uh, from the sun and put into this and stimulated by the biology of the turkeys and, and the fertility of their feed. You know, it's, we're making, making double use of their feed with this, like feeding the turkeys, but also feeding the soil. And that all works, uh, I should say, with organic certification, you have to be careful about Manure, I guess in food safety in general, you wanna be careful about manure application. So this is great in the fall because then it has all winter 
to kind of mel mellow and um, and meet the minimum requirements for organic production, which is 120 days between manure application and harvest. So it's easy to meet that over the over the winter. I will say humans uh, or animals, last time I checked, I think we're still classified as animals. So we're part of that soil food web. Uh, we add life and diversity to the land as well. Um, so yeah, here's a question. Is there any path to sustainability that doesn't include reintegrating humans into biologically productive landscapes? Um, if we don't sort of heal that divide between the quote unquote human world and the natural world, then um, they will be in opposition to each other and we end up with no world at all. So I like to think of I'd like to think of this as, you know, we're we're integrating animals into the landscape and adding our, you know, our mojo to the mix. You know, we're not adding our manure to the mix, but we are adding our energy and our, our time and our attention. And I, I do think that changes um, the land. I think the land responds. You know, that's that's soil health right there. The two year old seeing his first buckwheat flower. So under sowing and interplanting, another great way to get more diversity and photosynthesis on the farm. Uh, here are some examples. Uh, we used to just grow tomatoes on a mulched bed, which was great. We got great tomatoes, but you know we're missing that whole opportunity of what could be growing underneath the tomatoes. So now we interplant with either carrots or beets on the shoulders and sweet alyssum um, as a kind of flowering cover crop underneath. And sweet alyssum is great. It attracts all kinds of, <clears throat> excuse me. It attracts all kinds of uh, great beneficial insects, um, including the braconid wasps, which are the ones that parasitize tomato hornworms. So it's kind of a feel good package there with the, with the tomatoes. So here's kale under sown to clover. Um, one reason to do this is that kale and all brassicas are non-mycorrhizal. They don't form mycorrhizal connections. Um, so if you do have mycorrhizal fungus in your soil, which hopefully we're working toward, um, it gets kind of starved out if all you grow is brassicas. It needs that plant root symbiosis to survive. So by under sowing with clover, we're feeding those fungal communities, we're fixing nitrogen, we're keeping the soil covered, and we're, you know, harnessing the sun's energy and pumping it down into the soil, all with, um, without competing with the kale crop at all. In fact, I, I've seen the kale crops do better and not require side dressing when we did this. So, you know, without measuring, you know, soil tests or anything, just seeing the plant response, um, I do think there is uh, nutrient release happening one way or another from, from doing this. I, I will say the timing has to be right. So interplanting is all about timing and spacing. Because um, if we sowed this clover too soon, like if we sowed it the same day that we transplanted the kale, it would outcompete the kale. It would just grow over and we'd have a bit of clover. So we wait until the kale is covering about 50% of the bed with its green. If you sort of blur your eyes and look at the bed and see 50% brown, 50% green, that's when we broadcast the clover over top. If we do it later than that, the clover is not really gonna get established. It'll just be shaded out. If we do it earlier than that, then it starts to compete with the kale. And that's a theme with all interplantings. The timing and the spacing is really important. Uh, otherwise, you can, yeah, lose your your cash crop to whatever you've undersown. Here's another combination of uh, Brussels sprouts planted into rye with a, you know, why not do a strip of lettuce heads down the middle while the Brussels sprouts are still young. Here's some more interplantings in the high tunnel beetles with celery on the shoulder, uh, cucumbers with bok choy and uh, salad turnips on the shoulders. Uh, ginger with carrots interplanted. It's an imperfect grouping, but it makes a great soup. 
and then uh, radishes among the onions. Yeah, I got to make sure that you harvest those radishes because otherwise they will start to outcompete the onions. You know, like if you grow too many radishes and some of them sit there, then they start to outcompete the onions. So interplanting can be a little risky if things aren't really dialed in and, and you're not on top of them. You can start to have competition between the plants. Here's the carrots with the tomatoes again. Spinach on the shoulder of peas. Uh, sweet alisum in with alliums is great. Sweet alisum seed is very, you know, cheap and small, so you can just broadcast it and it'll come up through the mulch. And here's some more out uh, with the tomatoes. And here's clover under the tomatoes too. Once we harvest those, those beets, those carrots, um, then we can broadcast clover. And you can see now the tomatoes have had a frost, so they're dying. And we have a cover crop bed for winter um, without having the time to plant cover crops after the tomatoes. We sort of start that beforehand. And then here's the other interplantings that can be with perennials too. These are while our raspberry beds were getting established. You know, raspberries need about 10 feet between rows, but the first year they don't grow very big. So we grew a crop of carrots in between them while we we're waiting. So there's uh, there's sort of yeah, the spatial element of interplanting, but also the temporal element, especially with perennials. That a lot of sort of alley cropping or um, silver, silver, you know, growing between tree lines. Like, uh, there's a lot of great sort of permaculture ideas of growing your annuals while your perennials establish between them. Uh, here's another example of that. We have a row of peach trees going in. But they were still young, so we planted carrots there too. We grow a lot of carrots. Uh, so a good segue to perennial plantings. I love, uh, yeah, injecting perennial life into all the little corners and nooks and crannies of the farm. It's um, It just makes for a beautiful place to live and work, but it also really adds some resilience in terms of um, insect diversity so that if there are pests there are also a whole there's a whole slew of other insects that may be competing with that pest or pre predating that pest parasitizing that pest so <clears throat> it's um yeah i really see that playing out um with our pest pressure being less and less each year so here's in the spring what one of those beneficial beds looks like and here's in the fall and the goal is to have kind of you know a diversity of flowers in bloom throughout every you know every day of the year so that there's a continuous like food supply nectar supply for the insects um, and then also over thinking of overwintering habitat leaving some you know grasses and, and shrubs um, and mulch debris is actually really helpful for insects to overwinter. It's funny, I feel like often um, the experts sort of speak out of two contradictory messages of like, well, for soil health, you want, you know, lots of diversity and leave the debris on the surface and, um, and all that. And then they say, the crop specialist will say, well, for disease minimizing, you know, to minimize disease and pest pressure, like, Make sure to remove all debris and till it all under. So there's, there's kind of these two things coming at you, but I really believe that um, like getting that life spiral going upward, uh, more and more life, more and more diversity is what in the long term will save us all a lot of trouble um, instead of that mentality of like, we need to kill the pest, we need to kill the habitat of the pest. And that that is a downward spiral of removing life from the system, which ultimately is the cause of that pest being out of control, out of balance. Anyway, is there's a lack of life and diversity in that system. So, anyway, that's my, that's my rant on that. Uh, these these perennial strips are are wonderful, though. Uh, they attract not just beneficial insects, but they uh, they attract a lot of humans too. It turns out, like people just love to walk around the farm and and enjoy the the flowers and the beauty of, of these perennials. Uh, shrubs, you know, those, those were mostly herbaceous perennials, but shrubs are a wonderful way to get 
to increase the flowering, especially early in the season, because they typically can flower earlier than the herbaceous perennials. Um, so depending on the size of the space you have, there's the tall shrubs, eight to 15 feet. Um, these are what are native mostly to um, the Northeast, although I imagine there's a fair bit of overlap with Indiana. Um, and then there's shorter shrubs that, uh, you know, for tighter spaces. Um, generally shrubs get about as wide as they get tall. So if, if the heights are, you know, 15 feet, then you're gonna wanna leave 15 feet of, of width for that area, for that bed or that area. Um, what's great about these is they, a lot of them have, you know, crops, marketable crops with their fruit um, or they have medicinal value um, and as well as their sort of aesthetic and, and biodiversity value. So the herbaceous plants, again, we're trying to keep that overlapping bloom periods throughout the whole season. So looking from early spring all the way to late fall, um, you know, here's just a selection. There's so many to choose from, but here's a selection that I, I like. Um, you know, the crocuses and daffodils come first and, and uh, yeah, we move through the, the season with a lot of overlapping uh, bloom time. Um, not just looking at diversity of bloom time, but diversity of colors. Uh, different insects are attracted to different colors, also different shapes of the flowers, like whether they're really shallow or really deep. The different mouth bits of the insects and birds will, you know, affect what flowers they can have access to. So thinking about just diversity in general um, for all of that. And then for overwintering habitat, it's really nice to have these native grasses, uh, big and little blue stem um, or other sort of clump grasses. Um, just be careful how you pick those because a lot of grasses can end up being weeds too. So that's one of the challenges of these perennial strips is to keeping, keep them managed and mulched so that they're not sort of a safe haven for weed seed to blow around the farm. So yeah, every little nook and cranny of the farm can become a little, uh, you know, a source of diversity, um, but it does require management. So similar to our no-till beds, you know, we do the same method for our perennials. We'll make sure to kill the perennial roots of whatever's there, whether it's sod or whatever, uh, and then, you know, thick layer of mulch and plant through that. And once those perennials are established, you know, it takes very little maintenance, um, but we do try to mulch every, every other year or so, we'll add another layer of mulch just to make sure no weeds are finding their way up through. I can also just leave, you know, certain areas of the farm unmowed and let nature choose the flowers, um, which yeah, for us, we got a lot of different kinds of Goldenrod and Aster um, and uh, St. John's Wort, different wildflowers just are there naturally. So yeah, I, I really believe that soil health can be measured um, intuitively. I believe, you know, we are creatures of the earth. We are soil organisms. So we can feel when soil is healthy, like walking out on the land, uh, you know, using all our senses. Uh, the way it, the way it smells, you know, when it's, when you smell anaerobic soil, it is displeasing to the senses. Um, when, when you, the way it sounds, like if you hear birds and insects and stuff, there's like a, there's a tangible feel to that. Um, certainly the way it tastes when we eat the food. Um, yeah. And, and just the way overall it feels to move through that landscape will, to me is, you know, it's the ultimate soil test, if you will. Um, although soil tests can be helpful as well to get the, you know, the science of it. But, but, um, but yeah, I really feel like um, getting that feedback from people visiting the farm, like they, you know, and from, from us walking around and from the crew, like how, how is the soil healthy? Uh, we can, we can feel it if it is. And this is just sort of a fun side-by-side -side graph of starting out looking at the soil organic matter from our soil tests. Um, 
and then also our revenue per square foot of our um, yeah production and looking at how those sort of go went up at the same rate more or less um, yeah, I, I look, there's maybe more correlation than causation, but I, maybe there's some causation as well. I, I, I like to think of the health of the soil is also the health of the farm. It's our greatest asset. In a sense, as soil organisms, it is our only asset. It is us. So uh, if we're not caring for it, we're not caring for ourselves. And yeah, soil health is human health. Uh, we are... We are soil uh, temporarily walking around as humans, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I really we feed about three hundred CSA families, um, and it gives me yeah a lot of pleasure to think of the health we're spreading around the community. Uh, here's some more numbers. I think I showed some of this in the beginning, but yeah, three and a half acres, three hundred fifty thousand dollars revenue. Um, we, they, we're a three season farm, so we, we sell storage crops through the winter, but we're, we do pretty minimal winter production, a little bit in the greenhouses, but not much, uh, we're pretty much off from, you know, December through March. Um, and I started, uh, with $180,000 loan, uh, 13 years ago and have never had an off farm job. So sort of the farm has really paid for itself and has grown beyond anything I could have imagined it would grow into from those early days when I was just hoping it could survive to the next year. Uh, so yeah, I, I wanna you know, zoom out a little bit here and think about um, you know, soil health as part of this bigger system of, of uh, successful farming. You know, what does it mean to be a successful farm? Um, and you can think about that. Everyone might have their own answer, but uh, yeah, I'll give you my answer, which is uh, it's ecologically and socially enriching and economically sustainable. Um, once we get into trying to make it economically enriching, I think that's dangerous because then it's more of an extractive mentality. I think the goal is to sort of sustain ourselves financially, but really try to enrich ourselves ecologically and socially because that's what carries on to the to the next generations. That's what is built down the line. So what does that mean? What is what is success? You know, often um, often we talk about efficiency um, in farming or in production in general or in life in general. Like what is efficient? Um, so I like to I sort of like to unpack this a little bit. Um, and technically, efficiency is. Uh, you know, the useful work performed divided by the total energy used to perform it. You think about the efficiency of an engine, you know, the work, the work it does versus the, the calories and the fuel that it used. Um, so more broadly, that's, you know, progress toward a goal over the expenditure of resources it took to get there. And in economics and sort of the mainstream world this is defined as you know the goal is yield or profit trying to maximize those and time and money are the expenditure of resources so that's sort of our efficiency you know standard model efficiency is yield and profit over time and money um but what if you know in actual life what if it was more like uh our goal was quality of life imagine that uh and the and the resources are expenditure of our natural resources, our natural capital of the planet. So what if we tried to maximize quality of life using as little natural capital as possible? Uh, what if what if that were the metric of efficiency? Um, well, that's that's a whole paradigm shift, right? That's a different a different worldview. As simple as it seems, it's not it's not the paradigm we're in. Um, so so yeah, what is the value of this commute to work? You know, you walk out that door and you walk a hundred feet and you're at you're at work and your work is kind of playing in the dirt in the gardens. Like there, there's a quality of life there that doesn't show up as yield or a profit. Yeah, what's the economic value of, you know, installing a swing in your barn? Like there's, <laughs> there's, a, 
there's an efficiency to that. You know, there's the crew taking time to make a eggplant face and put it in the barn for people like that. Like that's efficiency in this broader sense of quality of life over expenditure of resources. So I think opening up the farm to to a uh, a more holistic vision of success has been really key for for the success you know of this farm and it's it's tied to the economics too because other people feel it customers feel it and they want to be a part of the farm and then there's a support for the farm that goes beyond just like a transactional value it's like a it's a relational value so yeah this essential question of holistic design how do you want your farm to be or you could step back and anybody could answer how do you want your life to be and there's plenty of people ready to answer that question for you but i really urge farmers and people to answer for themselves how do you you know what how would you describe your your ideal life or your ideal farm and then you have something to work toward that's not just yield or profit at, you know it's probably going to include yield of profit. That'll be part of the picture, but it's it's a broader, it's a more holistic vision. <clears throat> so here are some of the ways we've done that. We have our community carrot harvest every fall, which you can see the age range is from about uh, one to a hundred, and this is uh, this is like in some in the standard sense of the word, this is like the least efficient way to harvest carrots. There's just you know it's mayhem, it's chaos. It's <laughs> um, but it's also the beautiful community event, and um, you know a lot of these kids, it's their first experience pulling food out of the ground, and it's um, it's so lovely to see them experience that and to share the multi generational aspect of it. We pay people in carrots for their help, even though they probably are slowing us down from what we could do without them, but it's a beautiful event. So that's one way we've, yeah, prioritized a, a more holistic vision of success. I also do a lot of education, you know, farm tours and workshops, um, talking to ag professionals, you know, that I'm trying to prioritize, um, yeah, sharing, sharing of resources and information. Uh, we do donations. Um, we donate probably ten to twenty thousand dollars worth of produce each year, and we're part of a gleaners program. Um, so that's that also feels good to be connected to the community in that way. Uh, we have an apprenticeship program, which now we're yeah calling sort of a farm farm crew immersion, uh, sort of incubator farmer program where we train um, train farmers, and so this farm produces food, but it also produces farmers. And we've had a number of people go on and start their own farms. And now we have sort of a, a growing network of, of those farmers who are all still connected and um, connected to us and connected to each other. Um, so that's really gratifying to see as well, spreading all over the country. We have community dinners once a week, sort of, you know, we almost all of us live on the farm. So it's sort of a community feel as well. It's an experiment in, in communal living. Um, and yeah, community dinners once a week. We have uh, events on the farm. This is one of our burger nights with live music and, and you know, we offer food and drinks. Uh, CSA potluck here from the early days is a good, is a good crop there in the wagon, kids. And uh, here's another crew. Uh, just, yeah, grow really close with the crew each year. Um, really appreciate everything they bring to the farm. In a lot of ways, they've, you know, the different iterations of, of uh, apprentices have really helped shape the farm with their ideas and their, and their sweat, labor, um, and their, yeah, their personalities. Um, so we have a, yeah, really education focused model of, of um, employment. And uh, this, we call it horizontal management where we rotate through um the management roles so everybody's on a manager role for two months and they overlap with the next person for a month so the first month they're getting trained the second month they're training the next person so it's this is a great way to learn because i find the best way to learn is to have to teach what you're what you're learning um i was a teacher before being a farmer um 
so yeah, this way everyone is learning and teaching uh, throughout the season all the different aspects of of what we do. Uh, so that's that's yeah, I've had a lot of really positive feedback from switching to this model uh, three or four years ago. Here's our crew. Yeah, look at them. They just spread all that compost and mulch on the plot, and they're still smiling. So that's a good sign. So I like to quote. Uh, Fukuoka, when he says the ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. Uh, I think about that a lot. Um, you know, if, if we're not learning and growing and enjoying ourselves, um, then what are we doing? You know, we've, we've got we've got our one life here. Uh, and this is Mary Oliver quote. Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Um, to me, I, I really feel like yeah why waste time when we're when we're here for so short so let's let's figure out the way we want our farms to be the way we want our lives to be and let's, let's work toward that so for more no-till rants and uh any other technical information you can buy my book um or follow us fifthfarm.net or at fifth farm uh i think i finished with enough time for Plenty of questions. So, I can't hear anything. I don't know if y'all are talking or not. Well, uh, yeah, so they say we're not allowed to unmute ourselves. I assume someone's working on that. Otherwise, I can just keep talking, but I'd love to hear your, your questions and your insights, having worked with a lot of farmers. OK, Daniel, can you hear me? Yes, got gotcha you now. OK, great. Okay, everybody, we're going to uh, start uh, doing the Q&A. So uh, what we'll do is just raise your hand and we'll come over with a microphone and uh, get your question answered. We'll try to get him back. <laughs> so you can talk to your question here, but you have to have to project for the room. Okay. <laughs> okay, so my question is, have you seen changes in your water usage since uh, using the mulch and the compost method. So the question is, have you seen changes in the water usage since you started using compost and mulches? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, yes, we, I'd say we use less water. We need a lot less water overall relative to, you know, a bare soil system because we don't have that the same evaporative loss. Basically, the, the water can't wick through the mulch, so it wicks up to the mulch and then it stops. Whereas in bare soil, it wicks all the way to the surface and then it's um, evaporating with the wind. So yeah, I think we have lower watering needs. I will say we have more critical periods of watering when we direct seed, because direct seeding into compost, dry, you know, compost dries out a lot faster than soil. So we do need to irrigate more often, just little bits to germinate things in the compost. But once they're established and the roots go down into the soil, we need to irrigate very little. Okay, next question. How do you ensure that your compost is weed free? Like what treatments are you doing to your compost? Yeah, we- so they Oh, sorry, do you need to repeat that for everyone? 
So I, I'm going to repeat it for the room. Yeah. So how do you... I think I lost. lost so I, go ahead, Axel. You can answer the question now. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, no worries. Um, yeah, so we buy compost that is weed free. Um, yeah. And if we're making our own compost, we know it's not weed free. And I'll only use that on like the tree, crop, on orchard, or places where those weeds don't matter as much, where we're mowing. Um, so yeah, finding a source of weed-free compost is is you know the first challenge of of this. Um, often your waste management companies will have, if not finished compost ready, they'll have the feedstocks for it. Um, so yeah, I I would I think it really depends on where you are, but I there are often sources of compost that that should be weed-free. Ideally screened and weed free. So they're screened to, you know, half inch or, or five eighths inch. Um, so it's nice, friable, weed free compost. And you can tell if it's weed free because the pile will start growing weeds. If it's not, uh, it should be able to sit there for weeks and not grow weeds on it. Okay, next question. Raise your hand if you have a question. We'll bring you one of these, but try to project to the room because these only go over to Zoom. There you go. Oh, thank you. Is it okay to go? Yeah. Can you tell us, please, how you recruit your apprentices and what kind of arrangement you have with them? Is Did you build housing for them? Do you give them a stipend? Do you feed them meals every evening? And do you provide a vehicle for them? Yeah, great question. Um, yes, uh, we 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 do. I guess advertising. We have well at this point. We sort of have a name for ourselves, so it's mostly word of mouth that people find us. But in the early days, I posted on Craigslist. I posted on our website. I posted on um, Good Food Jobs, um, and I put up flyers around town. Um, we do offer housing. We offer um, a sort of allowance in our farm store. Um, we stock sort of basic groceries in our farm store as well. So we offer $230 a month for them to buy food in our farm store. We have one communal meal per week. Um, we do offer use of a communal vehicle um, and we offer a monthly stipend of uh, $1,300. Um, we also now offer the option for people to live off farm and get paid $15 an hour if, if they'd prefer to not, you know, engage with the wacky wild community thing. Um, so yeah, both those options, but yeah. The, and then we do, we take a half day every week and devote it to education. So there's value in that. You know, I take time to prepare some presentation or, or something, a program to offer every Wednesday afternoon, which we take off from work. So that's part of their compensation as well. Okay, next question. Sorry. Project. How important was your initial loan to your soil health practices? And have you paid off your initial loan? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I think the initial loan was just critical on in every aspect of the farm because I didn't have, you know, I think I had $15,000 to my name, but the land cost $150. And then I needed another 30 or so to start the farm. Um, so yeah, a lot of that went to compost. Um, but to me, that's like, those aren't pennies worth pinching to, to skimp on compost. Um, yeah, so I think that loan is, is critical. Um, 
if I ran out of compost and needed more, I, like borrow more money. <laughs> that, that would be my approach because I think it's it's worth it. It pays off, it pays for itself. And if you start skimping on the compost, spreading too thin, well, now we've negated all the benefits of that weed barrier and now we're stuck weeding all the time. So, so yeah, I think having capital to begin is, is crucial in, for every aspect of starting a business, but especially to not be skimping on the compost and mulches to get that soil covered. Okay, next question. I was wondering, is there any difference between growing in the high tunnels or the hoop houses and the methods that you use on the out in the open areas? Yeah, good question. No, we use the same bed dimensions, same trellis techniques. Um, it's pretty much the same. Yeah, we try to keep it the same, uh, same sort of standard bed prep, you know, flipping beds. The only difference in the tunnels, we tend to crop more, like, you know, we have winter crops as well as summer crops, um, but we cover crop in the tunnels too, just like outside. Um, so yeah, basically the same methods. Yeah, we'll tarp in there, we'll flail mow in there, same as outside. Okay, next question. Yes, I had a question about wild raisin as a shrub, and I was curious to um, maybe the Latin name or another common name. Thank you. Mm, yeah, good question. All right, test me. Um, I'm blanking on it. Um, but yeah, I think I'm hopeful that if you Google wild raisin, it would give you that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting it. But yeah, it's got a nice little like berry that's edible. It's, you know, not really like production oriented, but more of a wildlife and, you know, nibble on crop. Yeah, it's a viburnum family. Um, viburnum nudum looks like somebody looked up. Yeah, sounds right. Hey, next question. Um, I was curious about your irrigation, and I noticed you used a sprinkler. Do you also use, um, like, drip lines? Yeah, great question. Um, so we use exclusively wobblers, sprinklers, for overhead sprinklers in the field. We don't do any drip in the field. Uh, we do use drip in the high tunnels um, on tomatoes and cucumbers. But we use overhead as much as possible um, because I really don't like drip tape. Uh, it's very hard to ensure it's well lined up over the crop. Uh, the wind blows it. The water pressure moves it around. Uh, rodents chew it. Uh, it's very hard to troubleshoot. You know, you turn it on and then a few hours later, you realize you have a pond at the end of the bed. Um, whereas sprinklers, you just turn them on, you watch them go, and you know that they're working. So also just the amount of plastic that is required to irrigate a plot is a huge amount, and it ends up getting tangled and holes in it, and we end up throwing it out much more regularly. Um, I've yet to replace a wobbler sprinkler, sprinkler head, and I've had some for, you know, 12 years. So yeah, I'm a big proponent of overhead um, with care, though, because it does get the plant leaves wet more often. So we try to we try to irrigate at night as much as possible when the plants are already wet from dew. So it's not getting them any more wet than they'd already be. Um, and we try to irrigate sort of uh, infrequently, as infrequently as possible, which is pretty easy with our sort of covered soil. It doesn't require a lot of water. Yeah. I think that's what I got on, on drip versus sprinklers. One extra question. Are there any new and exciting practices you're looking forward to trying on your farm? 
Always, always. Um, yeah, I think the next, I don't know if you'd call this a practice, but I think it kind of is, is uh, I want to build a pond um, to have that diversity. Um, you know, right now we have sort of forested wetlands nearby. We have open field, we have forest. But to have that pond ecosystem at the edge of the field and the forest would just bring in so much more life. Um, so, so yeah, I'm excited for that. Um, yeah, in terms of growing in the field, just different experiments with cover crops, um, doing more, uh, yeah, more overwintered cover crops, um, different varieties, experimenting with those. Um, and then, uh, yeah, another practice, if you will, the whole farm is just to keep improving the housing, the living situations for the crew so that we have maybe transitioning more to a, a more perennial crop of, of humans as opposed to practicing annual annual agriculture with our human turnover. Okay, next question. Come on, everybody. This is a great opportunity. There we go. <laughs> For the perennial hedgerows, um, can you talk a little bit more about if you were to start those, any just certain tips besides just the the varieties to choose from? And are there any unintended consequences that you guys have experienced from them? I'm just imagining rabbit pressure, you know, good habitats for the good and good and the bad stuff. For sure. Great question. Um, yeah, learn from my mistakes. Uh, I would decouple the woody perennials from the herbaceous perennials. Um, so if I could do it again, I'd have like, our beds are five feet on center. I would do three beds of perennial strip and the outer beds would be herbaceous perennials. The inner bed would be woody perennials because the herbaceous perennials, it's really nice to flail mow them uh, in the fall or the spring to do cleanup because a lot of the stalks just end up kind of standing there dead and can block the next year's growth. So to leave room for the flail mower, to flail mow the herbaceous perennials. <clears throat> right now we can't do that because we have, you know, shrubs and trees mixed in with them. Um, another thing I would do is keep things a little more organized. I was sort of like, ah, just mix it all up and throw it in there. But um, I think it's actually helpful to have like blocks of a given species, maybe like at least five row feet, maybe even 10 row feet at a time um so that uh it's a little more organized a little more easy to tell what's a weed and what's not a weed because that's actually a real issue for the crew you know we have to do a whole presentation on plant id just to be able to weed in the hedgerows um because we got to recognize what's what um so having those in blocks i think would make that more obvious also i've heard some you know people believe that you know, it's more efficient for the insects to harvest a lot of things all at once instead of flying around searching for the one flower amidst the others. Um, it's also, we actually have a whole business now that's grown out of the perennials of selling root splittings. So we have a perennial nursery, which I didn't really anticipate, but, you know, all of these perennials we can split and sell in the spring. And there's like, there's actually a really good market for that. Uh, you know, we do $6 a pot for a gallon pot. Um, so having them in blocks would make that a lot more efficient too, easier to find in the spring when they're just coming up. So that, yeah, that's what I would do. Um, yeah, more organized, separate woody from herbaceous um, and maybe have like a, yeah, organize it with a, like a little map of where things are so you can keep track of it all. And be careful of um, anything that, if you Google it on gardening forums and stuff, anything that says is like, watch out for it spreading, you know, anything that's a vigorous spreader, uh, maybe watch out for that. Goldenrod is known for that. Um, there are other plants that are just great at self seeding. You know, they might be good for pollinators, but they're also really good for filling in your garden beds with weeds. So maybe avoid those. Um, and then in terms of rodents, yeah, unintended consequences. It's great habitat for, yeah, right, for all kinds of life, maybe even the life you don't want, but I find by pruning the shrubs up, so, you know, keeping keeping the, the bottom couple feet really clean around the shrubs, 
that will that will help a lot with the rodent pressure because you know predators can get in there and get at them and then um yeah flail mowing the the perennial the herbaceous perennials will help sort of reduce that habitat a little bit i will add for indiana also uh, we have a great team at the nrcs state office so our wildlife biologist brianne lowe is here um, and robert susan with the pollinator partnership has also been uh, contracted to help with small scale uh, lists that also comply with equip and are really indiana specific maybe help okay uh next question i'll just talk real loud you think you can hear me no okay i'll just talk real loud i'd like to know i saw a lot of high tunnels and um maybe some like wells or fencing or improvements you've done have you had good luck with um grants from the USDA and do you have any hints about how to get those awarded? Yeah, yeah, we've had a number of grants through the NRCS, which is the USDA. Um, uh, yeah, we've gotten probably three or I think three or four high tunnels from them, and as well as um, some irrigation access road, um, a little bit of money for mulching and cover cropping. So not much. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, but yeah, in terms of how to advice for how to get that, like just for us, it's just, you know, go into your local extension office and sit down and ask them what's available. And they did most of the work to, you know, submit the application for that. Um, it was, yeah, very, very easy. I don't know if that's true in every county across the country, but um, yeah, it was a pretty straightforward process to just go in there and and uh, yeah, honestly, I found they like they often were like uh, as clueless as I was in some ways. <laughs> like they didn't really know what the funding was like, or um, but you just sort of like apply for everything that sounds good and throw it out there to the BC people and you see what comes back comes back. Our panel this afternoon can go a little bit more into EQIP and that particular farm bill program. And I would say yeah, our district conservationists, our soil and water employees, and our extension agents, like that is a good first point of contact. Yeah, yeah they're super helpful. And, and yeah, I felt like on the real advocates for, for farmers. You had a slide that um, put your uh, annual income at six figures. And I was wondering if that was gross or net. And how would you guide a beginning farmer who wants to make six figures in farming? Yeah, that's definitely gross. Um, yeah, we gross about $350,000 a year. So 100,000 per acre, but that's, yeah, gross before all expenses. So, um, I would say if you want to make a personal salary of six figures, don't farm. Um, <laughs> if, if you want to make a farm income that high, yeah, it's uh, start, you know, I started small. My first year, the farm grossed, I think, $40,000, uh, which was, which felt awesome. I was psyched. That was a huge success. I remember my first farmer's market, I made $85 and I was thrilled. It was like the first money the farm ever made. Um, so, and then like before I knew it years later, you know, you know, farmer's markets bringing in $3,000 a market. So I think it really is amazing how it can grow as long as you have the right ingredients there for success. And that, that comes from some experience. So maybe, you know, make sure you, you have some confidence growing, but then it also takes some risk of like taking out that loan and going for it. Um, yeah, my, my good friend always tells my apprentices like bet on yourselves, bet on yourself, like take out that loan and bet on yourself. You know, it's all, it's all a gamble, but like bet on yourself because you know yourself and you know how, what you're capable of. Okay, 
Hey, Daniel. It seems like the Earthway Cedar is a like a big part of your operation. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? And then like like towards the beginning when you were first starting out, was it? So it's kind of hard to push that thing through like a soil that's not tilled. And you use a lot of compost, which probably helps. But is there any beds that like it's hard to push through? Or how do you like overcome that? Like I'd love to know more about the Earthway and just how you use it. Can There's, you repeat the question? Because we couldn't all hear it in the room. Thank you. Sure, I can repeat that. Yeah, so he's yeah asked about the earthway cedar, how we use it, um, how we overcome you know debris in the soil uh, if it's hard to push through. Um, yeah, we use exclusively the earthway cedar for all of our direct seeding. Um, I've experimented with the jang, um, but I actually prefer the earthway. Uh, I actually find the earthway easier to push through debris. Um, the jang, the angle of the handle is such that if you push it down, it pops a wheelie. Um, so, yeah, I, I just couldn't get it to work as well through some of the debris that we have to push it through. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, we have pretty good success with the Earthway. The, I will say certain seed sizes are not ideal. It just don't, doesn't have the right plate size for them. So, like, cilantro seed um vetch seed like that size seed is just like right in between the plate sizes for the earthway so they really just need to come out with another plate size um but it's right in between the radish plate and the beet plate so we end up using the beet plate and it puts it down you know too thick um so we've actually put some beeswax in every other hole of the beet plate and that you know makes it better um but yeah in terms of getting it through debris i find the earthway is actually outperform the jank for, for me. Um, it is imperfect. Um, and definitely, you know, we're, we're always seeding into compost. So we always have that couple inches on top of whatever, um, you know, even if we're forming a new bed, we're tarping it, we're killing the sod and then we're putting compost on top. So we're seeding pretty much into that compost. So we don't even need to like hit the clumps of sod that might still be decomposing underneath. Um, that said, sometimes there's, you know, cover crop stubble or debris that's just too much for an earthway or any cedar. So that's when we will either rake that debris off the bed or we'll broadcast right into the debris. And um, we've actually had good success broadcasting into the debris of, of uh, you know, the rye. And then uh, we'll actually run over it with a flail mower just once to just to jostle it so that the seed falls through. And then we have our sprinkler set up so we can irrigate um, as needed to make sure that germinates and grows up through the rye. So we'll typically do that with another cover crop into the rye, but that bypasses the need to get an earthway or any cedar through the stubble. Okay, this is gonna be the final question. Come on, don't pass up on this great opportunity. <laughs> They're talking about the online question. Go ahead. Hang on, Daniel, we're working on it. Just one second. So I have a quick question. Um, our farm is a lot like your farm where we till once and then we come back and we kind of do the lasagna method of building up the soil. Um, and this past year, we found um, that we had heavy, like, critter um, problem coming in and wanting to eat. I did notice that you only use hot wire fencing when you have, like, the turkeys or other livestock um, grazing. Do you use that to um, deter pests, like deer, rodents, and other things? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I think someone else asked that, too. We do have a fence, a perimeter fence around the farm for the deer. Because over the years, the deer figured out how good our carrots are, I guess. And they just, yeah, they, <laughs> and they teach the next generation. That one teaches their kids and it's exponential. So, yeah, we, we fenced out the whole farm a few, maybe five, six years ago. And that was necessary. I, I yeah, we lost about $30,000 that fall to deer damage. Um, so, yeah, deer, you know. I believe in sharing, but deer, you know, they, they just really do a lot. Of um, they take like one bite out of every lettuce head going down the row. So it's like, geez. <laughs> um, 
so yeah but in terms of smaller rodents um you know we i get that question a lot and we certainly have some voles and some mice we do have a farm cat that helps she's a good hunter but um i just it's not out of control i don't and i'm not sure exactly why maybe there's enough habitat for birds of prey and and other predators um maybe there's yeah other other predators coming in and, and keeping those populations in check besides the farm cat but um yeah i mean we have all these perennial areas we have all these herbaceous you know perennials um there's a lot of habitat but there's also a lot of diversity of habitat there's a lot of open ground we keep the grass mowed around the plots i think that helps um and we definitely have a lot of birds of prey circling around you know uh hawks and, and falcons and yeah so for what that's worth yeah it's hard to know exactly the, the root causes of it but yeah yeah the the electric fence we just used when we had livestock we don't use that for uh, predator control okay uh that daniel can you hear me yes great i'm gonna speak up a Hey, let's give Daniel a round of applause, please. And uh, from all of us, thank you very much for uh, taking the time. Uh, I know you're very busy and to uh, provide and share your wealth of information with everybody. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Hi. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so we're going to have a quick break. Um, come back.